We're going to shift gears now and move away from anatomic regions and start talking about clinical scenarios in which imaging the temporal bone is particularly important. We'll start with probably the most frequent reason to image the temporal bone, and that is hearing loss. Clinically, we divide hearing loss into sensorineural and conductive types based on whether you have diminution of air conduction only or whether both air and bone conduction have been diminished because there's a problem with the underlying nerves. Mixed hearing loss is some combination of both sensorineural and conductive hearing loss. So if we have these different clinical scenarios, do we image them all the same? No, we image them differently. Sensorineural hearing loss usually is a problem with the cochlea or the IAC or the cerebellopontine angle, cistern or the brainstem, and those areas are better imaged with MRI. So for sensorineural hearing loss, we use MRI and we use a very particular protocol dedicated to the temporal bone. For conductive hearing loss, we're worried about things like ossicles and the middle ear and the tympanic membrane and the external auditory canal. And those areas, because they're made of bone and air, are better addressed with CT. So we use uh, unenhanced CT of the temporal bone for conductive hearing loss. What about mixed hearing loss? How do we cover both conductive and sensorineural causes. It might be tempting to say, order everything, do both, but uh, that's probably unnecessary. In mixed hearing loss, there are some very specific diagnoses that we are worried about, and they are best imaged with CT. But we want to hedge our bet a little bit for that sensorineural component, make sure we're not dealing with a big vestibular schwannoma. So we end up with contrast enhanced CT of the temporal bone, just to hedge our bets a little. So sensorineural hearing loss, MRI of the temporal bones. Conductive hearing loss, unenhanced CT. Mixed hearing loss, enhanced CT. Let's begin our discussion with sensorineural hearing loss. Probably the most common cause of sensorineural hearing loss is presbycusis, which is uh, degradation of hearing with age. The most common thing that we identify as a source of hearing loss is a cerebellopontine angle mass, and of those, vestibular schwannomas are the most common. Uh, we've already covered that topic. Uh, meningeal disease, particularly meningeal carcinomatosis, uh, also inflammatory diseases, can cause sensorineural hearing loss. Brain stem tumors, um, demyelinating disease, particularly if, if it involves the brain stem itself. Chiari 1 malformations, oh, Chiari 1 malformations can cause any symptom, you pick it. Uh, it can be associated with Chiari 1 malformations, certainly on that list, sensorineural hearing loss. And then labyrinthitis ossificans and congenital anomalies of the temporal bone. That's where we're going to spend a lot of our discussion. So what's labyrinthitis ossificans? Labyrinthitis ossificans is the end stage of any insult to the labyrinth, to the membranous labyrinth. The most common causes are meningitis and trauma, if you allow that surgery is a form of trauma, because probably the most common cause is surgery. This is an inexorable progressive disease, but it evolves at a variable pace. Some people have rapid progression, some people have very slow progression. There are distinct stages of the disease that have distinct imaging characteristics. In the most acute phase, all you see is inflammation. You see enhancement within the membranous labyrinth itself, and that's it. Then, fibroblasts begin to infiltrate into the membranous labyrinth. They displace the normal perilymph and endolymph that is supposed to be inside the membranous labyrinth. So you lose the normal T2 signal because it is replaced with dark fibrous tissue instead of bright liquid. But there's no change in the CT because the fibrous tissue and the liquid both look the same on CT. So you have MR changes, but no CT changes. Then comes the bony stage, the last stage of the disease, where you see calcifications infiltrate and those fibroblasts turn into bone. 
this is a slow process. You get an early infiltrative bony phase. Eventually, you can get a complete whiteout, and you can't even see where the cochlea used to be. At that point, obviously, both the MR and the CT are abnormal. Here's an example of labyrinthitis ossificans in its acute phase. You can see abnormal enhancement on this T1-weighted image all through the cochlea, all through the labyrinth, and all through the semicircular canals. This is the earliest stage of the disease, and this is the only sequence on which you'll have findings. Now comes the fibrous stage. Notice on the normal side, you have a beautiful image of the uh, bright T2 signal in the labyrinth and cochlea and semicircular canals. If we look to this side, the cochlea is gone. The labyrinth has a weird, uh, the, the, the vestibule has a weird configuration. You can almost see a ghost of the lateral semicircular canal, but they're starting to fill in. We're starting to lose that endolymph and perilymph and the T2 signal that goes with them. Here's the fibrous stage on CT. Looks totally normal. You can't see the fibrous stage on CT. Once you get to the bony stage, now CT comes to the fore. Instead of a nice banana or gherkin of the uh, basal turn of the cochlea, here you can see only the anterior half is still patent. The posterior half is starting to fill in with bony material, uh, abnormal calcium, filling that in, and this is a progressive disease. It'll eventually fill it all in. Here it is at the end stage of this disease, labyrinthitis in its uh, complete form. The cochlea, I can't find the cochlea. The vestibule, there's this little wisp of something. Semicircular canals, forget it. They're all gone, total whiteout as end stage labyrinthitis ossificans living up to its name. Since we're talking about labyrinthitis, it seems like an opportune time to discuss a rare entity called a la intralabyrinthine schwannoma. Most schwannomas that affect the labyrinth have a component in the internal auditory canal with a waste at the cochlear aperture, so you get a classic dumbbell appearance. But sometimes you see enhancement exclusively within the labyrinth itself. It may be very difficult to know whether you're dealing with an acute labyrinthitis or a schwannoma. Often, you just have to follow it up over time and see whether it enlarges, because it's a schwannoma, or whether it goes away because it was labyrinthitis. Be careful of intralabyrinthine hemorrhage. When you have trauma to the cochlea and vestibule that may not be enough trauma to cause an actual fracture of the otic capsule, but just enough to jar the membranous labyrinth, you can get hemorrhage into the labyrinth itself. At first glance, you might mistake this for enhancement because it looks just like the labyrinthitis we were just talking about. But if you look carefully, this is a non-enhanced scan. So that's intrinsic T1 signal. That's intralabyrinthine hemorrhage, usually a result of trauma. Let me take those last three diagnoses that I've just shown you and put them all on one slide because they look so much alike. My mentor in head and neck imaging, Jane Weissman, used to love to do this, used to love to put mimics up right next to each other and force the trainees to try and figure out what the two things were and differentiate between them. So shout out to Jane, um, who set me on the course of head and neck imaging. This is an image of labyrinthitis, right? This is the acute phase of labyrinthitis ossificans, and this is enhancement, inflammatory enhancement, all through the membranous labyrinth. This next one is a schwannoma. It hasn't yet had an opportunity to expand the otic capsule, uh, but it looks just like the labyrinthitis. This is an unenhanced scan, intrinsic bright T1 signal from hemorrhage labyrinthitis, schwannoma, hemorrhage, all looking a lot alike. Let's turn now to congenital anomalies that cause sensorineural hearing loss in children. The most common of these, and in fact, the most common cause of congenital hearing loss that we can identify 
is vestibular aqueduct enlargement. This is closely associated with the large endolymphatic sac anomaly, LISA. The next thing we'll talk about is the spectrum of abnormalities that affect the cochlea and vestibule. This is a, a spectrum, but we do sort of put names on particular waypoints along the spectrum. At one end of the spectrum is the Michelle anomaly where there is absolutely nothing there except a whiteout. There's no cochlea, no vestibule. Looks remarkably like the end stage of labyrinthitis ossificans. Uh, next point along this spectrum is a common cavity anomaly where there's just blobs, but they have no real architecture to them. Somewhat further along, actually substantially further along, is the Mundini triad, a classic triad of three radiologic findings. And then the least severe end of the spectrum, incomplete partition. We often see this as an incidental finding in people who have no discernible hearing loss. The next thing we're going to talk about is cochlear nerve aplasia. This is a critical diagnosis because you really don't want to put a cochlear implant in a patient who doesn't have a nerve to stimulate. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, strictures and enlargement of the cochlear aperture that are associated with different forms of hearing loss. The enlarged vestibular aqueduct is the most common identifiable form of congenital hearing loss. The normal vestibular aqueduct runs from the back of the vestibule to the posterior fossa, and it allows recycling of endolymph and perilymph back into the CSF. The normal vestibular aqueduct is about the same diameter as a normal semicircular canal. So you can use that as a reference point if you're convinced it's normal. So you can see how much large this is, like three times the diameter of that, and that is enlargement of the vestibular aqueduct. It is usually bilateral. Now let's turn to the spectrum of abnormalities of the cochlea and vestibule. At one end of the spectrum is the Michelle anomaly in which there are no discernible elements of the membranous labyrinth within the otic capsule. Just nothing there, a total whiteout. Um, it is a fun test question to ask how you can distinguish between the Michelle anomaly and uh, the severe bony form of labyrinthitis ossificans where everything's whited out. Obviously, these are nowhere near the same clinical scenario, so it's just a game we're playing here. But it turns out that the cochlear promontory uh, forms in response to the basal turn of the cochlea. So in Michelle anomaly, there's no cochlear promontory, whereas in labyrinthitis ossificans, there was a cochlea at some point, so there is a cochlear promontory even after that basal turn fills in. A fun game with no actual clinical relevance. Next is the common cavity deformity. Here we see the initial form of the cochlea and vestibule as a single bag at the end of the internal auditory canal. There's no differentiating individual elements of the cochlea or vestibule. In fact, there's no way of differentiating them from each other. That's why we call it a common cavity. This is a severe form of dysplasia. Just one big blob. Next, we get into sort of a vague area that encompasses much of this spectrum that we call cochleovestibular anomalies. And you can call them severe, moderate, mild cochleovestibular anomalies. Um, in this situation, it looks a lot like a common cavity, but you can make out that there's going to be a cochlea anteriorly and a vestibule posteriorly, and this has sort of got the shape of a lateral semicircular canal, and there's a posterior semicircular canal. There are bits and pieces here. It's a big blob, but the blob is divisible into different parts. So this is a severe cochleovestibular anomaly. Here is a mild cochleovestibular anomaly. We're just moving further along the spectrum here to a more and more differentiated ear. Here you can see that the cochlea is actually separated from the vestibule. You can almost get a sense that it was going to start to spiral up at some point. Um, the lateral semicircular canal severely dysplastic, but it's got its central bony island. 
right? And you can see the posterior semicircular canal coming off. So you can all, make out all the elements here, although they are clearly severely dysplastic. This is a mild, this is the mild end of the spectrum of cochlear vestibular anomalies. The next thing we're going to talk about is incomplete partition type 2, the more severe form of the uh, disease, type 1 being less severe. In incomplete partition type 2, there are no visible bony scala separating the upper turns of the cochlea. You can still see the basal turn at the bottom, but the uh, middle and upper turns of the cochlea are no longer divisible by bony scala. That's what we mean by incomplete partition of the cochlea. Incomplete partition is one of the three elements of Mondini's triad or Mondini's malformation. In addition to the incomplete partition of the upper turns of the cochlea, there is also enlargement of the vestibular aqueduct and there is also dysplasia of the vestibule, usually uh, enlarged laterally at the expense of the central island and lateral semicircular canal. You can see in this case how the posterior limb of that lateral semicircular canal has been widened, right? So this is Mondini's triad, and it is towards the more developed end of the spectrum. Let's take a second and review some of the anatomy of the nerves inside the internal auditory canal. Remember that there are two vestibular branches, the superior and inferior branches of the vestibular nerve. There is one cochlear nerve and there is one facial nerve. This is a really important diagram uh, indicating the relationship of those nerves. It turns out one of the four nerves lives in each of the four quadrants. If that's superior and that's inferior and anterior and posteriorly, people try to remember seven up and coke down for the anterior half where the seventh cranial nerve is in the superior anterior quadrant and the cochlear nerve is in the inferior anterior, anterior quadrant. And if you can remember that, then the posterior side is easy with the superior division of the vestibular nerve on top and the inferior division below in the posterior half. Okay, remember this arrangement because we're about to see it again. Here are a couple of steady state free procession images taken obliquely transverse to the length of the internal auditory canal on each side. So a little bit obliqued, but mostly in the sagittal plane. The left ear is the normal ear, and you can see those four nerves we were just talking about. Here's anterior, posterior, superior, inferior. So that's the facial nerve. That's the cochlear nerve, and there's the two branches of the vestibular nerve close to one another in the posterior half. That's what we're supposed to be looking for. Now, here's the same patient's right ear. You can see three out of the four nerves. Which one is missing? Uh, this one down here in the inferior anterior quadrant, that is the cochlear nerve, and it is absent in this pa patient. This is cochlear nerve aplasia. This is really important to identify because this patient will not benefit from cochlear implantation. There's no nerve there to stimulate. Even a tiny nerve can sometimes be adequate to uh, enable a child to hear after cochlear implantation. So you have to be absolutely sure you don't see any cochlear nerve there, um, like in this case. The cochlear aperture is the opening between the internal auditory canal and the medialis of the cochlea. The cochlear nerve goes through that cochlear aperture and then spirals up the medialis in the center of the cochlea. The cochlear aperture can be too small or it can be too large, and I encourage you to look at it on all your temporal bone imaging until you get a sense of what the normal size of the cochlear aperture is. It's much easier to see on CT than it is on MRI. Here is a situation where the cochlear aperture is way too small, very small cochlear aperture. This is usually seen in conjunction with the cochlear nerve atresia that we were looking at uh, on the previous slide. You can also have abnormal enlargement of the cochlear aperture. You can see that there is a, uh, a moderately dysplastic cochlea and vestibule in this child and accompanying that, you could drive a truck through that cochlear aperture between the internal auditory canal and the cochlea itself.
This is a specific disease in which you see an enlarged aperture. The internal auditory canals are foreshortened and the IAC uh, is sometimes widened. Um, there is an enlarged cochlear aperture. Again, just huge cochlear aperture there. Uh, it's X-linked progressive mixed hearing loss. And uh, now you're probably wondering what's this mixed hearing loss doing here in the middle of the sensor neural hearing loss section, but it fits in with the uh, cochlear aperture enlargement. Some people prefer to call this disease incomplete partition type three. Um, I find that harder to keep track of. X-linked progressive hearing loss is a little easier uh, to remember in my mind. Let's turn now to conductive hearing loss. There are innumerable diagnoses that can result in conductive hearing loss. I've selected a few that are common or have important imaging findings. This is by no means a complete list. The last one, superior semicircular canal dehiscence, uh, will be discussed in detail in the section on dizziness. So we'll come back to it uh, later in the, in the lecture, not right now. There are two terms that can be a little confusing because they sound like they're referring to the same thing, but meringosclerosis is sclerosis of the tympanic membrane. Anytime the tympanic membrane is thickened and inflamed, we can use the term meringosclerosis. It doesn't have to be calcified to say meringosclerosis. The normal tympanic membrane should be almost imperceptible, it's so thin, like right on this side. You get a sense that there's a maybe a tympanic membrane there, but you got to kind of know where it is and then use a little imagination. This tympanic membrane is markedly thickened, so this patient has moringosclerosis. Tympanosclerosis, on the other hand, is calcification within the tympanic cavity, not just the tympanic membrane, anywhere in the tympanic cavity, or if you prefer middle ear, any abnormal calcifications in the middle ear can be referred to as tympanosclerosis. So the fact that this tympanic membrane is calcified counts as tympanosclerosis. So this patient has both moringosclerosis, thickening of the tympanic membrane, and tympanosclerosis specifically of the tympanic membrane. Here's another example of tympanosclerosis. You can see that there are scattered areas of calcification uh, right at the additus ad antrum into the uh, mastoid antrum, and there's just too many ossicles in the epitympanum here. Those are actually ossicles. This is just dystrophic calcification, tympanosclerosis. There are a lot of inflammatory diseases that cause tympanosclerosis. It is classically associated with tuberculosis. Here's another disease that occurs in patients who have chronic inflammation. Chronic inflammation does a lot of bad things to the ears, and here's another example. Normally, it looks like the ossicles here at the level of the ice cream cone with the head of the malleus and the short process and body of the incus. Normally, it looks like the ossicles are floating in midair like there's nothing holding them up at all. Of course, there is something holding them up, and those are the suspensory ligaments of the ossicles, but they're too small and not dense enough for us to appreciate on CT. However, with chronic inflammation, those suspensory ligaments will ossify, and then they become visible because they're thickened and they're calcified. So you can see this lateral suspensory ligament of the incus as a bony bridge between the incus and the lateral wall of the epitympanum. In fact, the medial as well. Often it is the anterior suspensory ligament of the malleus that becomes um, uh, ossified. So we call this lateral fixation of the ossicles or fusion of the ossicles, and it is uh, another cause of conductive hearing loss. Here's an example of that anterior fixation where the anterior suspensory ligament of the malleus is ossified. Same basic idea. Hearing loss is a long topic. This seems like a good spot to take a break. We'll resume with cholesteatomas in the next lecture.